Okay, okay. Now, now we are, we can go, we can go ahead now, I think, because I see that. Uh, I, yeah, I think we can start probably. Um, it's recording and there is. The, the translation is not working yet. No, please. Uh, okay. We need the, 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 the host for one minute to configure the, the audio channels. It's only one minute and send you back the, the host, please. Also, it's going live on uh, Facebook and YouTube as well? Yeah. Oh, okay, then I'll wait till that goes, right? So I'm, I'm told that there is someone called Isabel from the technical team that is trying to solve, you know, some kind of technical glitch and um, In any case, what, what I can see is that uh, we are re being recorded. Hello, I'm sorry, who needs to be host? Okay, so we are live now. I'm told that we are live and we can start Kikashin. So we are in your hands. Great, thank you so Thanks. much, Ms. Maria. And good evening, everyone from Toronto, Canada and good afternoon and good morning to everyone joining us from across the world. Welcome to the Global Women's Leaders Voices for Change and Inclusion and Women Political Leaders side event for the Generation Equality Forum, Mexico City, on the theme, how a strong multilateral system is fundamental to achieving gender equality and closing the implementation gap on women's rights. My name is Kehbisha. I am a United Nations human rights champion and founder president of global social innovation enterprise, Green Hope Foundation. And I am delighted to be your moderator today. It's now been 26 years since the historic adoption of the Beijing Platform for Action, a blueprint for gender justice that pledged, and I quote, we are determined to advance the goals of equality, development, and peace for all women everywhere in the interest of all humanity. And it's the last part of the phrase that refers to gender equality in the interest of all humanity that is of utmost importance because the fight for gender parity must be looked at through the lens of humanity. How can we talk of progress and dream of sustainable development when we ignore the needs and aspirations of one half of humanity? Women's rights are human rights and all our actions and processes must be attuned towards this. Todas las acciones han de ser encaminadas a ello. You, uh, interrupt, uh, there's the interpretation that is going in the main session. So if that could be fixed, that would be great. But just continuing uh, on, it's really important to understand that be it the impacts of climate change, of migration, of economic uncertainty, or even the devastation caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, we women and girls continue to be disproportionately impacted. And these impacts are multiplied manifold for those of us who live in vulnerable countries and communities. And as someone who works at a grassroots level with these communities, especially in the LDCs, I have encountered firsthand the terrible abuse and exploitation that young girls, children, and women have faced due to the pandemic, which is an exponential rise in child marriages, in young girls being sold off to feed the rest of the family, girls in these conservative communities being treated as a commodity, fully expensive. 
and none of this makes it to the news. It does not get captured in gender data. And how can it when Entonces, ya lo tiene. do not even have uh, the gender data? Gender data. And I'm sorry to interrupt once again, but uh, the interpretation is happening in the main channel. So if that could be fixed, thank you so much. And as I was saying, it's really important that we ensure that countries, which most countries do not have this, but budgets and legislation that mandates the collection and aggregation of genderized data is made normal. And this inequity must change. And the only way forward as we rebuild better is to address this through collaboration and multilateralism that will enable us to gain insights into material, social, economic, environmental, and political factors shaping poverty and our inequality, providing new perceptions about the multidimensional deprivations experienced by women and girls under varying societal parameters. And I am indeed privileged today to be hosting an extremely eminent panel whose speakers bring with them a wealth of knowledge and multidisciplinary experience that will draw upon that we'll draw upon actually in the course of our discussion. So our eminent speakers today are Mayo Avila, former Minister of Foreign Affairs of El Salvador, Maria Elena Aguero, Club de Madrid's Secretary General, and she's worked in the Inter-American Development Bank, the World Bank, and the United Nations Development Program. Maria Fernanda Espinoza, Ecuadorian politician and diplomat, and she was the president of the United Nations General Assembly's 73rd session. We also have with us Milan Birvir, executive director of the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security at Georgetown University. Kathy Calvin, who served as the president and chief executive officer of the United Nations Foundation and is one of the B team B leaders. And Gina Kazar, World Food Programs Executive Director. Welcome, panelists. And just before we continue with our panel discussion, we shall now watch a short video. Can we have the video, please? Thank you very much. And I shall now give the floor to uh, Maria Fernanda Espinoza, who will talk to us about the, a little more about the GWL. Over to you, Ms. Maria. Thank you so much, uh, dear Kakashan. And uh, uh, the technical team is apologizing for some technical glitches, but I think that it's solved. Unfortunately, we also uh, had a silent video, but it, I think it is okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Kikashan, and greetings uh, to all the panelists, uh, such distinguished uh, colleagues and friends uh, here. It is such a privilege to share the stage, uh, the stage with you all in this Generation Equality Forum. Congratulations and thank you to our host, Mexico, and to France and UN Women for bringing us uh, together. So uh, today I have two tasks. One is to briefly share with the audience uh, a brief description of our group of women leaders for change and inclusion, and to present very quickly our group statement for the Generation Equality Forum. Uh, who are we? We are a group of 54 women 
who join our voices to advocate for gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls worldwide. Uh, and uh, of course, we see multilateralism as a vehicle uh, of critical importance to support the achievement of equal, fair, and democratic societies. Uh, therefore, as mentioned, our key objective is to strengthen multilateralism and the multilateral architecture so it can serve uh, the purpose of building uh, equal societies and enforce and guarantee the rights of women and girls worldwide. We strongly believe that the multilateral system is central uh, to ensuring that international law and policy inform and guide a transformative action in the gender equality agenda, taking into account gender in all its diversity. The principle uh, spoused in the Charter of the United Nations and the CROSS, uh, the multilateral ecosystem, equality, dignity, peace, respect for human rights, and sustainable development will only be achieved if we address and overcome gender inequalities and discrimination using a cross-sectoral, transactional, and intergenerational perspective. It is under these uh, premises that we have been engaged in the preparatory works of the Gender Equality Forum uh, to support the speeding of the implementation of the declaration in Platform for Action of the Beijing Conference, and more importantly, for accelerating transformative action to achieve gender equality by 2030. So as uh, also as a member of the steering committee of the Generation Equality Forum, I have had the privilege to accompany uh, this preparatory process. And we believe that dialogue and action on gender equality is all the more important in light of the uh, ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. There is, and we know clear evidence that women and girls have paid the highest price and so suffered the deepest economic impacts uh, and magnified structural violence against them throughout the pandemic. Uh, therefore, we, we strongly believe that um, gender equality should be at the center of all recovery efforts, which should include action, for example, to, to protect and empower women, including through access to education and healthcare, cash transfers and credit, access to decent jobs and social protection, transform uh, the social organization of care and strengthening access to fully funded essential services for women and girls who have experienced violence in all its form. So there is a clear and urgent need uh, to ensure adequate and sufficient funding for an action-oriented ag agenda on gender equality and women's rights. And uh, uh, given that there remain uh, significant implementation gaps in the gender equality agenda. So uh, I think, and once again, recovery and rebuilding efforts should be seen as an opportunity to accelerate progress and help overcome the current equality crisis. These and other proposals can be of course found in our group's declaration for the Generation Equality Forum. Uh, there are uh, basically among our panelists today, there are the experts that are behind the crafting of this declaration. So we're very much uh, looking forward to, to hearing directly from our uh, group colleagues uh, uh, to, to address specifically issues of uh, how to better support victims of gender-based violence, uh, for example, how to promote economic justice and the economic empowerment of women, um, how to uh, encourage and push for a feminist action for climate justice, uh, how to embrace uh, new technologies and innovation as tools for achieving uh, gender equality, and uh, of course, how to support efforts around the women, peace and security uh, agenda and the uh, adoption of the Generation Equality Forum, very promising compact on women, peace and security and humanitarian action. We are going to hear all of our um, fellow panelists addressing these particular issues. And I would like to conclude by pointing out that it is clear that the implementation of the Beijing Declaration 
uh, and platform for action has fallen short uh, from the initial promise. And therefore, 26 years after Beijing, the best way to honor the principles and aspiration of uh, the platform for action we, would be um, to use this moment to change course and to implement bold actions that close the gap for women and girls' rights. The Generation Equality Forum has to be, you know, a major inflection point, a once in a decade opportunity to advance women's rights and tackle the gender equality crisis. We have uh, a golden opportunity here uh, to uh, genderize multilateralism um, through intersectional leadership, to network, to a networked, inclusive, effective, rejuvenated multilateral system. It is a moment of reinvention that we should not miss. Uh, with the right political will, with the vision, with the active engagement of all sectors in all generations, we can build forward better uh, a world that is more sustainable, just and free of violence, poverty and inequalities. Um, so uh, thank you, thank you Kakashen for, uh, for being here again, uh, uh, among us today and, and back to you. Thank you so much, Miss Maria. And yes, absolutely. It is our hope that uh, this uh, Generation Equality Forum serves as just not the end of the road, but the beginning for us to take bold actions towards uh, ensuring a gender equal world for all. So thank you once again. And with that, we shall begin our panel discussion. And I would first like to invite Ms. Gina Kazar to take the floor. And I do not see you as yet here, mm -hmm. but yes. You are now, here. now I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And let me start, well, as always, <laughs> saying that this is a privilege for me to be in this so important panel and of this event. By the way, I am Mexican and I am in Mexico. <laughs> so it's uh, it's strange to be in Zoom, but I'm, I'm really glad to be with you this, uh, this afternoon. Uh, let me start by saying that as a current member, of a, a multilateral or a, a UN agency, the World Food Program. I can tell you that I, I am, let's say I'm convinced, but I can, I can say it with experience that a strong multilateral system is fundamental to achieving gender equality and to close the, the gap on women's rights. So I'm living, you know, I, I live it every day and I believe that this is important. And let me, let me clarify something. Uh, our host, our, our moderator said that I am the executive director of WFP and I'm not, I am the assistant executive director. Uh, and it's a, it's a new, assistant executive director that my, my title is workplace culture and I'm in charge of all the agenda of diversity and inclusion because I think WFP uh, maybe as the first UN agency recognized that it has to be at our level at my level to uh, move forward this, uh, this agenda of diversity and inclusion. That is exactly what we are you know, talking today when we are talking about gender equality. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna speak a little bit about how in WFP we divided the, the approach uh, to gender equality in two ways, externally and internally, meaning externally with our beneficiaries and internally with our employees. And obviously, uh, I think externally, it's, it's, it's interesting to see how uh, an, uh, a humanitarian agency can make such a big impact in changing lives of our beneficiaries. As you may know, our focus is zero hunger in line obviously with the SDG2. Uh, this focus is more urgent now than ever. 135 million people suffer from acute hunger. And let me repeat acute because hunger is much more than that. And this is due basically for man-made conflicts, climate change and economic downturns. And obviously now the COVID-19 pandemic 
it can double this number. We are estimating that it could put another 130 million people at risk of suffering acute hunger. So this is really, really urgent. And as you all know, because you are experts on this, uh, girls and boys, but women in general are suffering more than, uh, than ever in terms of hunger and, uh, and let's say, uh, uh, let's say inequality. Yes, um, let me tell you that we are very clear at WFP that we won't be able to achieve zero hunger in the absence of gender equality. Now, we, we have proof of this in terms of data, in terms of programs, in terms of evaluation. We know this for sure. And that is why in WFP, we envision a world where all women, men, girls, and boys can exercise their human rights, obviously, including the right to adequate food. This is why the pursuit of gender equality and women's empowerment is central in fulfilling our mandate. Um, wherever we work, I can tell you, in saving lives and changing lives, we have to tackle or we must tackle the inequalities that oppress and discriminate against women and girls. And we are clear in promoting equity and empowerment of all. Uh, we believe that a world with zero hunger can only achieve, be achieved if every woman and girl has equal opportunities and equal access to resources and very important, equal voice in the decision that shape their households, communities, and even societies. In WFP, we decided to design and more than design, implement a gender policy five years ago. And let me confess that it was, uh, let's say, trigger by, uh, because we realized that our food security and nutrition programs were not always adequately addressing gender equality and women's empowerment. That is why uh, we decided to set four uh, important objectives that we, I am sure you will recognize as really important to have the impact. And what is the impact? Imagine WFP has, is serving 100 million beneficiaries, a, a big percentage, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not willing to say exactly which one, but more than half and, and close to 90 maybe are women and girls. So imagine the impact in designing our programs with these lenses. So the first objective we set was to ensure that food assistance is ad adapted to different needs and capacities. This is a very challenging thing, but we are really trying to have in all our programs this objective very much on, on, at, at the top of our agenda. The second one is related to equal participation. We believe that women and men participate equally, have to participate equally in the design, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation of gender transformative food security programs and nutrition programs. The third one is to ensure that women and girls have increased power in the decision-making regarding food security and nutrition in their households, their communities, and their societies. Uh, and the fourth, uh, it's the last but not least, is regarding gender and protection. Food assistance does no harm for, to the safety, dignity, and integrity of women and girls, and is provided in ways that respects the rights. So all together, this has, uh, you know, now we are five years from uh, this policy was approved. And I can tell you that we are being able to have better data about what, how, what we're doing in terms of gender equity. We have better monitoring of our programs and trying to ensure in very different contexts that our women and our girls are under these uh, principles of gender equity, equality and empowerment. Obviously, internally also is really important. As may, you may know, WFP has grown really 
a lot in the last five years. We are now more than 20,000 employees, a lot of them nationals. And internally, obviously, we know that to serve the needs of our beneficiaries, we need to focus internally in our workforce. So in our workforce, we have very clear targets of gender equality. There are obviously some programs in some countries that is difficult to get to our targets of 50% of more women, but we are every day working towards that target. And I believe the executive director, David Beasley, is you know, very, very committed to do this uh, because we believe that gender equality internally within our workforce and for our beneficiaries, that it's the first uh, part of, of what I spoke, is a goal we are relentless in and we will not stop until we meet our, our targets. So I believe uh, it's very clear that multilateralism is key uh, to advance this agenda. And I'm very proud I am in, in WFP now, but I started also in GWL Voices and I'm still very close to, to the group. And I'm really happy to, to really try to, to move forward in this important agenda. Thank you very much, Fernanda, Maria Fernanda, and everybody, welcome to this important panel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Uh, Kazar. And, you know, we talk so much about the fact that every single SDG has gender equality at its core, but thank you for talking about how important it gender equality is in the achievement of SDG 2. I don't think that's talked about a lot. And as someone who works in that area of food security and gender equality, I'm really happy to hear you talk about that. And hopefully uh, more people understand how important gender and women's rights is to food security, food sovereignty, and uh, as achieving SDG 2. So thank you once again. And with that, I would like to now invite our next panelist, Ms. Kathy Calvin. And Ms. Calvin, I'd like to ask you, what tangible actions do you think must be taken to advance the women's agenda in this multilateral system and ensure our meaningful participation in all aspects of agenda setting, decision making, and implementation? Over to you. Thanks so much. And it's great to be here. It's great to be in Mexico City, even virtually, and, and to see all my fellow panelists today. Um, there is so much opportunity right now. This is a, a critical moment, 26 years after Beijing. And actually, um, I guess how many years uh, since the first women's conference, which was held in Mexico, to be coming back here to have this conference and talk about multilateralism, a feminist agenda, and the way forward where we can truly achieve generation equality and gender equality uh, in, in our lifetime and lock it in for the future. We've got to make concrete steps happen at this, at this meeting to lead to a very successful conference in Paris in the summer. And I think the ways we're, we're going to get there are to do a couple different things. The first is to recognize the feminist agenda that the that UN Women is putting forward, that the Secretary General is talking about, and what are the elements of that that we can be putting more wind beneath, behind their sails. Second, we need to recognize that the multilateral system is critical to achieving this, not only in negotiating sessions that take place in places like CSW, but in creating spaces for civil society and civil groups to come forward and play a key role and actually ensure that monies and resources, which are woefully lacking but need to be grown, are getting to those frontline groups where they can make the decisions about how best to spend them. We need to start with data. Uh, that was the focus of the conference here in Mexico so long ago. It was a major topic in Beijing 26 years ago many of the gaps that we saw then are still in existence. So unless we commit to using data to make policies, using data to find out where the problems are and reporting on data and holding every, every count, country avail, uh, accountable for that, we're gonna be missing the opportunity to make a really big shift. Third, we've got to make sure we talk about 
sexual and, and reproductive health and rights. They are critical to making sure women have the ability to play the role that they should be playing in public life and in their economy. We can't let that one slip by us. And fourth, it's a, it's a really important time for us to, to acknowledge that as a feminist plan, we are talking about changing who in order to change how. If we're gonna really change the, all, all of our systems to make them fairer and more balanced and more productive for every member of society, then we have to change who's in the room, who's in charge. That means more women, but it also means people who believe in feminist issues and are willing to work together across, Gina, as you said, all, all of the intersectionalities where we can make a difference, whether it's in climate or food or any of the other issues on our agenda. So I think it's a really exciting time. And I know all of our panelists have lots of other specific uh, items. I I'll just say for a final note, if um, this is such a, a critical moment for us also to hold ourselves accountable, to make a difference and not let up this year. It's, it's, this is the year we have to make it concrete. COVID, which so disproportionately affected women, gives us every reason and every opportunity to make sure that we build back better. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Calvin. And yes, we can view this pandemic as an opportunity to rebuild better and understand where we went wrong before and how to move away from that old normal and create a new normal. And uh, thank you for saying that, you know, in order to change the system, we have to change the people who are in that system. It's kind of a chicken and the egg situation, but we do need to change the people in order to change the system. And that's really, really important. So thank you so much once again. And with that, uh, we shall now have our next panelist, Ms. Milan Verveer. And Ms. Verveer, uh, I'd like to ask you that looking at Turkey's recent withdrawal from the Istanbul Convention, what do you think it means for different countries to start withdrawing from international agreements? And what impact do you think that would have on gender, peace, and security? So over to you. Well, thank you so much, Kakashin. And, and it's just a pleasure to be with my, my fellow colleagues from GWL and, and really to be part of the gender equality, generation equality uh, forum, which really, it, is going to do so much to catalyze uh, another whole era of progress, I believe. You know, Kakashin, you had said at the beginning that we should focus on the word humanity. And why? Because women are half the population of the world. And that is so true. This is a moral imperative uh, to ensure equality for all, including for women especially, which is this journey that we've all been on. Uh, but also we should bear in mind that no country can get ahead unless if it leaves half of its people behind. So there is no progress for humanity period if half of humanity is left behind. And too often I believe we look at these issues as a zero sum game. If a woman has economic opportunity or if she runs for political office, then I, the other half of the population and somehow diminished. And that could not be less true. So we have to really keep in mind and stress how this is about everybody and gender equality is for everybody, particularly for those who are still struggling for equality. So I thank you for that. I, I think also in, in raising the issue of um, this anniversary period, a year late than when we had intended to do this. Uh, but what happened in Beijing, and I'm sure many of us who were there, remember what it did to catalyze a movement. It was so inspirational. And for young women, uh, it changed their lives. Uh, and I think we would like to see some of that coming out of these convenings, whether in Mexico or later in Paris, um, that we come to understand it is a cross-generational movement. Uh, there is much that was accomplished after Beijing. We are living with the fruits of that, but there is a long road yet to travel. Uh, and so that multilateral system we've been talking about is critically important in that. 
Um, and after all, it is the multilateral system that has given us the frameworks for gender equality, uh, whether it's CEDA, whether it's the fourth world conference, the four world conferences, starting in Mexico, ending in Beijing, um, whether it's the women, peace and security framework, all of this has come out of a commitment to gender equality on the multilateral level. And we are obligated to make it work despite all of the problems. Now you mentioned the Istanbul Convention. The Istanbul Convention came out of a multilateral system. It came out of the European Council, which developed this extraordinary framework, legally binding standards to ensure that progress be made against that global scourge, violence against women, domestic violence, gender-based violence, intimate partner violence. Uh, it is manifested in so many ways. And it created a framework for protection, prevention, and prosecution. Uh, and what we're seeing, we had country after country ratify making good progress on ensuring that as they ratified the convention, they would abide uh, by the standards that were developed after extraordinary efforts by so many people. Uh, and what has happened lately is we are experiencing a pushback and it's manifested in various ways. Um, and this pushback uh, has caused some countries to de-ratify, already ratified. Uh, and this happened just a week or so ago in Turkey, when in the middle of the night, uh, the president of Turkey decided to decertify, de-ratify Turkey from its obligations under the Istanbul Convention, which it was the first country to sign. Uh, so there has to be an effort to deal with this pushback. The other thing we're seeing is countries that had fully intended to comply with the Istanbul Convention. We're making changes in their own laws uh, to ensure to the international standards are experiencing within the countries an authoritarian movement that says, this is all about destroying family values, or this is not consistent with our culture. And they're using buzzwords uh, to really go against ensuring that these standards can be adopted or retained. One of the biggest pushbacks is against the word gender. So if that word gender uh, has come to, uh, in some authoritarian and fundamentalist ways, signify that which is wrong, uh, that is what the opponents are doing. Uh, and in a country like Ukraine, for example, that fully intended to ratify, they began to experience this pushback uh, within the country. Fortunately, they adopted strong national laws, but they were not able to ratify because of what was happening within the country and the opposition to it. So what does that tell all of us? Here we are gathered uh, for this extraordinary convening uh, to to, to rekindle, to renew, to grow uh, our commitment to gender equality. Uh, and it means that we have to educate ourselves. Uh, we have to create an awareness. We have to deal with the lies that are being perpetrated about what this does. How does protecting women from violence destroy family values? It doesn't. and and we've got to create counter pressures to take on this political opposition uh, and come armed with all of the facts, but beyond that, with the political will uh, that will hold legislators accountable uh, for what, what they are doing, because it is, uh, it is objectionable for what it represents for human beings, for women, it is objectionable for what it does to economic progress in a country when women can't work or be productive because of what happens to them. Uh, it is tremendously horrible in terms of what it does to the health impacts of women. So there is so much at stake uh, in what you asked about. 
uh, but in a way, it's also a metaphor for so much else that we have to do to stop the pushback because it is very much with us today. And I think there was a pushback really for the Beijing conference. I, when I was working on it for my government, we experienced all kinds of opposition just even to get there to express women's rights as human rights. That pushback is manifesting itself again today in very different and similar ways. And it's gonna be up to all of us to address it. Absolutely, thank you so much. And it's really horrifying to note how with just one country or one person saying that it quote affects family values, gender, for example, it kind of creates this negative domino effect where other people suddenly feel that you know, that gender equality is effect negatively affecting the society when you know, the opposite is true. So yes, we do need that education and we definitely need that education to create the mindset change, preferably starting right from the childhood level so that our children and next generations grow up without that bias in their minds and actually be able to respect everyone regardless of any social determinants. So thank you once again, Ms. Revere. And with that, I'd like to invite our next panelist, Ms. Maria Fernanda Espinoza. And Ms. Maria, you've dedicated your life to ensuring gender equality. And what can be better done to improve and incentivize women and girls' rights? And how can we address discriminatory laws and barriers that are actually preventing women's full political and economic participation and decision making. So over to you, Miss Maria. Well, thank you so much, Kikash. And I think I have spoken, you know, a, a lot already, but you know, very quickly to respond to, to your question. I have, as you know, I'm, I'm a, you know, a, a strong believer in uh, intergenerational co-building and intergenerational dialogue. I think that we have a shared responsibility uh, to make uh, the changes uh, that we need at the regulatory, the policy, and, and, and the, the legal scaffolds, both internationally and nationally. I think Milan was very clearly saying that we do have you know, a very a comprehensive international architecture that has to translate into national policymaking, national uh, and legal scaffolds. Uh, uh, and this is the responsibility, not only of messianic leaders or heads of state and government, but uh, a responsibility from civil society, from the feminist movement, from academia uh, and uh, from parliaments. Uh, I think that um, we need more women in parliament. Uh, if you look at the numbers, uh, it is not very promising. Uh, still, 75% of parliamentarians worldwide are still men. And we not only we need more uh, women in parliament, but we need more younger women and the younger generations, uh, Kikashan. Uh, you, you have uh, uh, been so instrumental, for example, in the climate agenda. I have seen you, you know, firsthand, you know, being a climate advocate and in working not only at the multilateral level internationally, but, uh, you know, being a change maker uh, uh, at the ground level with working with local communities. So this is, uh, I think, what, uh, what we need, uh, you know, greater participation of, of women in parliaments, uh, greater engagement and, and civil action a civil society uh, active uh, engagement. And, and I think it is not only about uh, women's discrimination and, uh, and what we have seen in terms of setbacks, not only in delivering on the international uh, instruments, but also at the national level. And, and I fully agree that uh, we need to strategize better uh, to, to know how to, to address in a more efficient manner, uh, the, the pushbacks that we have witnessed. And uh, I, I recall very vividly uh, Hillary Clinton's speech in Beijing. 
and uh, it was obvious that she was also responding to a series of, you know, setbacks and, and very conservative approaches to women's rights and gender equality. And we need to continue uh, doing that. Uh, that that's what I, uh, I, I would say. So thank you. Thank you, Kikash, and back to you. Thank you so much, Miss uh, Maria, and thank you for your kind words. And yes, definitely, we do need to bridge that gap between the top down and bottom up processes and ensure that there is accountability and responsibility for the betterment of our planet and societies at all levels, national, regional, local, and of course, international. So thank you once again. With that, I shall now invite our next panelist, Ms. Maria Elena Aguero, to take the floor. And Ms. Aguero, my question to you is very short and direct. What do you think should be put in place to secure the next Secretary General of the United Nations as a woman? Over to you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Kakashan, and thank you all very much. Um, it's a, it's a short, but it's not an easy question because it's it's a matter of realizing among other things and, and Milan and others have already referred to this, that there is a question of a political will, but also of the links between what happens at the national level and at the multilateral level and the multilateral level and then the national level. Um, the Club of Madrid is as a, as a, colleagues know uh, we focus on uh, democracy that delivers but also on multilateralism that delivers and from my personal experience with the multilateral organizations it is that the multilateral organizations be it at the regional or at the global level are only and can only be what the member states want them to be so in order to have uh, achieve that goal say, of having uh, a woman secretary general of the UN or head of, of uh, any multilateral organization, uh, the work has to start at home. The work has to start at the national level. Having those channels and having those uh, levels of, of, of women's participation uh, in, in government, in decision-making processes, I think that in many ways, Maria Fernanda can probably speak to this topic much better than I can, but it seems to me that it definitely has to start at the, at, at, and perhaps even at the local and the national level and, and keep gaining those spaces, is gaining the spaces, but also gaining the, 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 the transparency of the process, the transparency that will allow for the candidatures to appear um, to, we, we know from, from um, well, research that, that has been done that, for example, international organizations are more likely uh, to elect or select women if there have been women in those positions before. Now, um, the same, I suppose, will happen with candidatures, with more women having been candidates in the past election of the UN Secretary General, maybe there will be more women candidates in the process now. Um, the, the also, you know, this, this was the, say the first part of the first corner of the glass ceiling uh, was already broken quite a bit uh, in, in the last round uh, because there were a number of, of excellent women candidates. Now, We've come a long way. I think that, that one of the things that, that we have to uh, realize and that I sense from what colleagues have been saying thus far is that yes, we've come a long way, but there's still a lot to be done. And, uh, and in, this, uh, in this sense, in getting uh, women in those positions, as Maria Fernanda was just saying, having women's um, in engagement and participation and election to parliament, uh, to cabinets, as heads, as heads of government, we have only 22 out of 193 countries that have women as uh, serving as heads of state and or government. And, you know, there are over or nearly 120 countries that have never had a woman leader. Um, so there's, there's still a, a, a very, very long way to go. And I think that the, the beauty of what we've been hearing uh, thus far this evening is that I think most of us are looking at the situation and especially as, as it has been exacerbated by the COVID-19, by the evidence that women have been 
uh, suffering, let's say, or or being affected um, a lot more seriously than uh, than than males in this COVID nineteen pandemic. Uh, the one very important thing is that we see this also as an opportunity, and I think we, this we have learned. Uh, this we have learned, and maybe we come with it uh, that women tend to see. Uh, different occasions, difficult as they may be, also as an opportunity, as an opportunity to to grow, to advance, and to move forward. So I would say that you know, what do we have to do in order in in, in that road to have uh, women uh, or a woman as as secretary general is above all to start at home and making the the spaces so that women can be candidates and that women can have the opportunity and having as transparent and as, um, as fair uh, a process as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Kikashan. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ms. Aguero. And yes, it has to begin at home. Any change needs to start with yourself from home, and then we can actually take it to the global level. And while we have achieved a lot of progress, we still definitely have a very, very long way to go to achieve through gender parity. So thank you once again. And I'd now like to invite Ms. Mayu Avila as our next panelist. And Ms. Avila, we've seen firsthand that countries with women in power have shown a better management of the situation with the pandemic. But how can we expect a COVID recovery that includes a gender lens if women are so underrepresented as parliamentarians? Over to you. Thank you very much, Kakashan. It's an honor to be with this distinguished panelists in the Generation Equality Forum hosted by Mexico and now virtually. This is really a feat and I appreciate and applaud it because it has given also a width of ban, making it much more accessible to thousands around the world. So I, I am also um, very much in line with what has been said before, because at the end, the pandemic, what it has given us is an opportunity to visualize and to value the essential contribution of women. And we see it in many fields. You are now only mentioning only one political leadership at its highest level, where we saw Erna Solberg, you know, from Norway, where we saw Hacinda Arden from New Zealand, where we saw Angela Merkel, you know, from Germany, Katrin Jakobsdottir from Iceland, and Mette Frederiksen from Denmark. And I could continue on and on with so many others. But what is important also, and I want to bring to the table now, is that it is not only them at this very high level political leadership roles. It, you can see it also in the paid work that even though women lost most of the jobs during the pandemic or in increased domestic work in the accompaniment of virtual study of children where women had to do maybe remote work but also had to homeschool or help their children access virtually, maintaining the family, assistance to older adults, all of this doing it in the front lines of combating the disease in hospitals and health centers, all of this demonstrates you know, how women are the essential fabric of our society, how we complement, and how it is not necessarily that we just look at women in power to show better management, but also to see it then thus in every single aspect of life. And there, one of the aspects I would really want to emphasize is the economic participation of women. Women that have an access to employment protection or that have measures that reduce or redistribute the domestic and care responsibilities. Where we find legal reforms that eliminate laws that directly or indirectly discriminate against women, we will see women thriving and helping to build these assets. And we will also see, and I'm convinced, the reduction in Domestic violence, because of women that is self-sufficient, will be less vulnerable, as we saw during COVID-19. So sad, the increase in domestic violence on a daily basis. 
but thus we, there's an enormous opportunity as we see, as all of my colleagues have stated before, the opportunities where with COVID, we can have the opportunity to rebuild better back. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Avila. And yes, thank you for talking about the importance of a women-led circular economy. And that is so crucial towards achieving a, a more sustainable and uh, gender equal world. And definitely we can use that as the blueprint to rebuild better and create that new normal. So thank you once again. And thank you so much to all of our panelists for your very insightful remarks on this very important topic. And we shall actually now take a few questions from the audience. Just a reminder, audience, you can leave your questions in the Q&A box and we'd be happy to ask our panelists those questions. We already have one that has come in and that is, how do we address the mental health stigma that women and girls, especially around the world, in particular in conservative communities face where they're often branded as witches and this gender specific target is not present in SDG3, good health and well-being. So what can be done to remove the stigma both globally and uh, particularly in conservative communities? Would any of your panelists like to answer that first? Yes, Ms. Calvin. Uh I'll, I'll just say a few words and I, I'm sure others have, have some thoughts. I, I've actually been very impressed that the Secretary General himself has spoken out on this, has made this a priority, has been willing to bring it into conversations, even when it wasn't maybe relevant or, or immediately obvious that that was the topic, because I think he, he too, even before COVID, began to recognize the um, epidemic of loneliness and di disengagement was creating bigger problems in terms of the way we treat each other, the way people were feeling and, and leading to severe mental health problems. So I think that the conversations that got started last year rely on all of us, whether we're women or men, feminists or not, but certainly if, if we can listen to each other and, and bring out this question of isolation and loneliness, it, it is such a gigantic epidemic and to ensure that it is part of any conversation about healthcare. I think we have to push for that and that may be a, a worthy opportunity to, to reopen that target. Mm -hmm. What we all need to do is, is find other allies. And I think this is another area where we can find allies that maybe we haven't even thought of talking to before. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, uh, Ms. Verveer. You know, uh, I remember when we were working on healthcare reform uh, in our country, uh, and one of the issues was, is mental health going to be covered? And it took an educational process, not that it was that long ago, to make people understand that this is part of holistic health. You have to address these issues. Uh, and whether it's human rights defenders today uh, or rising rates of suicide from isolation and other reasons, we have got as a community of human beings to, to rise to the occasion. I think Kathy's absolutely right. It takes allies. It takes allies certainly in the health community, the medical practitioners who have a lot of credibility to say this has to be addressed. But it also takes other people who are respected in communities uh, to stand up. You know, whether in certain cultures, uh, it's traditional leaders, religious leaders, whoever it is to rally around these issues because no life should be lost because attention isn't being paid to the serious issue. Uh, and I think it's one that we have made progress on just like people with disabilities. You know, in many societies, people with disabilities were shunned. You know, once you develop that disability, you know, you couldn't walk or whatever it was, you were no longer a productive citizen that slowly is ending because people came together uh, to ensure that this was addressed. And I think we have to do the same thing with this lingering mental health issue. Thank you so much. I see Ms. Maria Fernanda, your hand is raised. 
Yes, I, I only wanted to, to add, I, I just have to, to concur with Milan and, and Kathy, but uh, perhaps uh, add uh, two more elements. One is uh, universal health coverage and universal health, health coverage it should cover, you know, um, you know, public free universal access uh, to mental health treatment. And I agree with you, Kakashan, that there is stigma, uh, there is, uh, um, you know, a, a reaction in, in society that is not one of solidarity and understanding. And this has, of course, to change. But universal health coverage, if you look at the uh, 2019 uh, universal health coverage political declaration, there is, you know, a written commitment uh, from member states, from governments to address the issue of mental health. And mental health should be part of the primary health care basket of, of public services. And uh, in, in very uh, um, unequal societies, I think this, uh, the um, transactional discrimination also plays out. Um, not only, for example, for people with dis persons with disabilities, but uh, let's look at the GLTBIQ uh, population, for example. Um, they, they really need to ensure that they do have, you know, mental health support and, and services. And I think that uh, if uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has been, you know, a, a history of, of, of loss, of pain, uh, but also, you know, an opportunity to, to show that we are all vulnerable in a way. It has uh, put, you know, in evidence how interdependent, how weak and vulnerable we are in spite of, you know, all the, the high technologies, all the knowledge, the sophistication of, of our uh, 21st century world. Uh, we are in, in the same in the same wor uh, world and we are part of the same humanity. And uh, I think that we have to take uh, mental health seriously. And, and Kathy said it well, uh, I, I know from um, first hand experience how concerned and, and committed the secretary general himself is uh, on this issue and the World Health Organization as well. Thank you so much, Ms. Maria. I see Ms. Avila, your hand is raised. Yes, thank you. I also wanted to recognize the Secretary General's forward-looking call for peace in the home. And he did this in April 2020 during the pandemic. And much of the danger of domestic violence has a toll on mental health. And this was reinforced by the UN Executive Committee call in June of 2020 when they called for this political engagement strategy for all senior levels to have a coordinated approach to eradicate the domestic violence through specific actions. So I do believe it is a matter of individual and also of collective responsibility that we have to see the strength and magnitude of mental health within also domestic violence. Thank you. Thank you so much. And that actually relates very well, well to our next question. And that's, we all know that there has been an increase in gender-based violence during the COVID-19 pandemic, and even in developed countries that are supposed to be safe. And there is often a complacency that comes with a country being seen as developed, but the gender-based violence and other challenges affect vulnerable communities within those developed countries the most who have often been forgotten. What can be done to address these unique challenges of the vulnerable communities within these developed countries, especially in cases of gender-based violence that has seen an increase during COVID-19? I yes. think I think we've seen that literally any woman could be vulnerable to uh, this alarming increase in violence during COVID. It's been as a result of lockdowns, uh, the realities within the home, not able to communicate with anybody on the outside. So even if you're within a vulnerable community in a larger community of vulnerability, uh, you're feeling it that much more. One of the things that we should have learned from Ebola uh, and from uh, other kinds of health, pervasive health uh, epidemics, 
uh, is that this happens. Uh, we should have seen that it needed to be addressed early on because what happened during Ebola was shelters were shut down for obvious reasons. The protections weren't there. The security people who should have been alert to this were diverted to other tasks. And that's exactly what we've seen happen again with COVID. We don't learn uh, from past experiences the way we should. Um, and I think that it, it really requires, as we know, and I think the, the point that was made about um, mental health and abuse is utterly related to this, uh, that we really do need to understand that you need a comprehensive, um, uh, set of uh, protections, responses to deal with this problem under the most adverse circumstances, but that they are as important as so many of the other things that were put in place during this pandemic. And for reasons that become all too familiar, they've been marginalized as not as important. Uh, and so I think we have to uh, both learn from past experiences, but also understand why this is a critical issue that deserves so much more attention. Can't hear you. You're on mute. And you know, we haven't talked about discriminatory laws that much in this conversation, but that's, I think this goes to the root of so many countries don't have laws protecting women those who do don't often enforce them. And we could do so much better. I mean, the, the World Bank did a survey of 190 countries and only a, fewer, than, fewer than 10 had actually ever really done a survey of, of discrimination and violence. So we've got, we've got a long way to go to keep these topics on the front burner. And it goes back to the conversation also about women in parliament or feminists in parliaments. I mean, we ought to have men who speak out against this as much as we do women. I was muted. Uh, yes, Ms. Kazar, uh, thank you so much, Ms. Kelvin, by the way. Uh, thank, you. thank you so much. Uh, and let me tell you that if I have to choose one issue to tackle in the world could be violence against women. I am, you know, that Latin America maybe is considered the most uh, violent region for women uh, worldwide. This is largely dual uh, because of this, let's say, prevailing patriarchal culture, uh, which governs all, all our society. And as you know, with COVID-19, the numbers have gone dramatically up in uh, Latin America. And I think, uh, you know, the multilateral world owes to these women a response. Because I, I really support, uh, and it's, it's really complicated because I don't think it's lack of funding, let's say, of people interested in, in you know, moving this forward, but it's such a complex uh, issue that get, that has cultural governmental government institutions obviously corruption and it's this intersectionality that we were talking before that it's really getting to a place that I don't and, and I I'm, I'm I'm not happy to listen to Milan opening our eyes that it this is going not very well, you know, in terms of how we're making progress. You, you said about Ebola and we didn't learn and COVID, I was also in Ebola and UNDP. So, so it's amazing that there's, a, the, we haven't yet got the formula on how, you know, to let's say break this uh, cycle about poverty, gender, culture, uh, violence. Uh, so, so I am, I am, just shocked reading what's happening in my country. And you saw uh, that it went international, what happened with this, uh, these femicides that are, you know, it's reaching like six, seven out of 10 women are, are suffering from violence in, in my country. So yes, this is urgent. <laughs> thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much. I see Ms. Uh, Avila, you have your hand raised. Thank you very much. I just want to add to Gina in the sense that I completely agree that ridding the world of domestic violence should become a priority. 
But for this, we need perseverance. We need zero tolerance. And we need adequate resources used in a coordinated and effective way by the leadership at all levels. And we saw it in COVID when all of the security forces that were trained to be able to respond to women in danger were completely focused on, on others. The emergency lines were shut up. There, there were not hotlines. I saw some countries that did some, some type of uh, efforts by putting emergency lines at supermarkets where they knew the, late, the woman will be able to go and there she could, she could make a call. So lack of action is neither an option nor a choice now. It is only then that the home and the world will be a better place for all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, definitely. And thank you for uh, sharing that. Uh, and the last question that we have today is, just today, the state of Arkansas in the USA passed a bill that bans certain types of health care for transgender youth, something that is a direct violation of human rights. And that is just one example of the numerous discriminatory practices that the LGBTQIA plus community faces around the world, whether it's uh, through discriminatory laws or even just through biased mindsets. What can be done to reaffirm their basic human rights and stop this discrimination locally and globally? Well, I, I, let me just start. I, I think, for, first of all, it's unforgivable that this happens. We're also seeing uh, state after state in my country banning transgender athletes uh, from participating in, in team sports um, in ways that they should be fully entitled to. You know, I think what we saw is tremendous progress, never enough, but progress for the LGBT community that came from the realization that this is one of us. No, it's not differences that should be proscribed or punished, but it's my next door neighbor, it's my physician, it's people I cherish and care for. Uh, and we have to come to understand um, that human dignity and human rights are everyone is entitled to, uh, not exceptional causes where you get treated like a more marginalized person uh, because of who you are. Um, it is a, a process, but it's part of the countercultural war in many ways that I alluded to early on with the pushback. Uh, what we're seeing is politically, uh, some forces are seeing this as the wedge issues in which they can make progress on their overall ideological agenda. Uh, it is unfortunate. It goes to mental health because you can you imagine the mental health consequences of these actions? Uh, so it, it is again going to require good people speaking up. It's going to require political officials to say that's wrong. Uh, and it's going to require everybody uh, doing what each person can. Um, but it is a despicable set of uh, circumstances that are, are being um, pursued uh, in, in ways that they have no place. Absolutely, couldn't agree more. And as our attendee wrote, it, it is a direct violation of human rights and horrifying. Thank you for uh, your answer. Would any of our other panelists like to answer? Or if not, oh yes. Uh, Hi, uh, no, I, I wanted to comment on, on what, what we're seeing and what we're discussing and the way we are addressing it is just showing us the various layers of polarizing elements and how all of, there are different elements that are pulling us apart in, in, in many different directions and for many different reasons. And one of the things that we have to aim at, and, and Milan was just referring to it, is, is human dignity. I mean, it's, it's, it is this emphasis on, on what brings us together uh, and, and what is the reason that we are all human beings with, with that human dignity and deserving of, of respect of our human rights? Um, and and not, not ignoring what is 
polarizing us and pulling us apart, but acting on it and acting on it requires political will and action. Uh, and, and, you know, we've got to move in that direction. Uh, and, and it has to start at the local and national level so that then we can, you know, it, it, it's a two way thing. I mean, the, the, the multilateral gives us the framework that also um, protects uh, protects us and allows us to to have certain measures, but the the ideas and the and the need has to be expressed from the national, from the local towards the multilateral, so that yeah. the multilateral can can act. Absolutely yes, and a life of dignity for all, leaving no one behind. So thank you so much, and thank you to all of our panelists for your answers. And I'd now like to ask each of our speakers in one minute, maybe, to provide key concrete actions or steps that you think are important for achieving gender equality. So we shall begin with Ms. Mayu Avila. Thank you very much. To me, it is important to take into account the private sector. It is not only at the multilateral level with governments, but it is also at the private sector in practices in the way that together public and private sectors plus civil society can adopt measures to promote and to increase the participation of women. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Avila. Uh, Ms. Maria Elena Aguero. Yes, um, I'd like to focus on, on the change in mindset and the importance of education and not just of girls and women. I think we have spent an, um, a number of years uh, perhaps just unconsciously uh, speaking about education for girls and women, but it has to be for everybody. It is only in that way that we have, that we can change the mindsets and only in changing the mindsets will we be able to act differently. And that is what we need. Thank you so much, Ms. Aguero. Ms. Maria Fernanda Espinoza. Let me unmute myself. There are so many things that, that there is a, a long checklist uh, that we can draw only from this conversation. But perhaps I will say, you know, women's economic empowerment and, and to look carefully at, at the care economy. I, I, have, I am a strong believer that the care economy is the economy of the future. And, uh, and I think that it has, we need to invest more in the, in the care economy and, and, and just consider it, uh, consider it and value it as part of a very critical social infrastructure uh, for society. And, and I can not agree more uh, with uh, the need uh, to uh, uphold the very principles of multilateralism, um, cooperation, solidarity. Uh, I think it is an, a matter of self-interest. And uh, we have seen, unfortunately, uh, for example, with the vaccines and, and the operation of the COVAX, which is a multilateral scheme that has not worked well because of uh, uh, what it's been called now uh, vaccine nationalism. So it's not working because we know, we know that uh, no one would be safe until everybody is safe. So solidarity and cooperation and a, and a vibrant multilateral system is much needed uh, to, as a vehicle for uh, gender equality and uh, women and girls' rights and dignity. Absolutely, thank you so much, Ms. Maria. Uh, Ms. Milan Verveer. Well, I, I associate with everything that's been said already. Um, and just a personal note, uh, a few years ago, I wrote a book with a co-author called Fast Forward. And both of us coming out of different arenas were very troubled by the fact that we weren't making enough progress on these issues uh, and took the test of how do we accelerate progress for women and girls. And our bottom line was that each and every one of us has power, no matter where we sit, no matter what our positions. And if we put purpose to that power that we have, and connect with others, whether the private sector, male allies, all the untraditional ways of promoting this agenda based on an evidence-based case, uh, we can bring about accelerated change. And I think the bottom line is it's gonna take all of us 
and everybody has a role to play. Yes, totally. Thank you so much, Ms. Verveer. Ms. Kathy Calvin. Well, you know, I understand the Secretary General yesterday called uh, gender equality the unfinished human rights struggle of this century. And he also called out power as, as probably the biggest hurdle to it. So I think we also need, in addition to everything else we've said here, we need courage to stand for what we think ought to happen, to reach out to bring others along and to not give up and just continue to push for the biggest commitments we can, allocation of funding where it needs to go, holding ourselves and others accountable um, and, and really joining with your generation, Kakesha, to really make this not only gender equality, but generation equality. It, it's time, it's got to happen, but it will only happen if we put, a, put aside some ways we've tried to do things before and really grab this and push back against the pushback. I think it's time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Calvin. And last but not the least, Ms. Uh, Dina Kazar. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, for me, I think strategic partnerships maybe. I believe that, uh, you know, it's very, so important, the collaboration but and coordination uh, in terms of the multilateral world. Uh, we know, you know, basically at the UN, uh, the, we, we have to improve our collaboration in these issues. You know, uh, I know UN Women obviously is the leader on, on this agenda, but you know, we, we need to work together and collaborate and get the right partnerships. I, I heard about private sector, about national governments. I fully agree that it's not, you know, even the secretary general, but it's, you know, the governments. I, I really welcome when I see in the general assembly, as we saw a president, that it's a woman, but also, you know, the member states have to participate on this. So we, we need to find the right partnerships, uh, you know, to really, uh, tackle this issue together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Kazar. And thank you to all of our panelists for your deeply engaging and informative and insightful uh, comments. And it's truly a motivating experience for me. And I'm sure I speak on behalf of our virtual audience as well when I say this, that they, they too would echo my thoughts. And as all of you have highlighted, drawing upon your vast experiences, partnerships, are going to be of critical importance in bridging the gaps that exist in the implementation of women's rights and gender equality. And the process of creating a new normal must center around building gender resilience, addressing issues of our health, our economic well being, our safety, our freedom, and above all, guaranteeing our space in decision making where we are not just the bystanders, but we actually decide for ourselves, not just letting others decide what we want. And our rights to development, the economic, social, political, gender, and environmental justice must all be addressed in equal measure. And this will, of course, require that truly multilateral approach, engaging all stakeholders, bringing together all actors, nations, institutions, forging public-private partnerships, civil society, so that all of us together can surmount the challenges, defeat fundamentalism and the archaic biases, and create a world that guarantees a life of dignity for every girl and woman, and really for every person, regardless of their gender. So thank you once again. Please take very good care of yourself. Stay safe and have a wonderful rest of the Generation Equality Mexico City Forum. Thank you so much, everyone. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay.